I have a number of disclosures. Um, I'm a co-inventor of the technology I'm going to discuss today, and the bulk of the intellectual property has been assigned to the regents of the University of Colorado. Uh, my um, co-collaborators on this work, um, and spe uh, specifically Greg Grudick and I co-founded a company called Flashback. Uh, it's a company we spun out of the university back in 2009 after licensing the technology from the university. The research is supported by multiple federal, uh, state, and local grants, but primarily the Department of Defense. And lastly, the technology under discussion is not approved by the FDA. There's nothing for sale. So what I'm going to talk about is a computational algorithm that allows us to peer into the compensatory phase of hemorrhage. Um, this algorithm is composed of a combination of feature extraction and machine learning technologies which were used to derive new knowledge from the waveform data generated in a model of human blood loss. The original algorithms used the non-invasive blood pressure waveform, however the current algorithms use the pulse ox waveform, and I actually have a device on you can watch my CRI change during the course of the lecture, and then I'll run around a little bit at the end and you'll see how it changes further. I'll spend most of my time uh, talking about the fundamental work that went into developing the algorithm. I'll touch briefly on a couple of clinical examples and then give you a little bit of a look into the future about what we're working on currently. So my objectives are to describe the compensatory phase of hemorrhage. Um, my hope is that you'll be able to understand some of the differences between lower body negative pressure, which is the model that you use to, dev to develop the algorithm, uh, and differentiate that from true hemorrhage and then recognize some of the potential risks and benefits that arise from statistical modeling of hemorrhage, because I think you'll understand by the end that this type of technology is something that's going to be um, broadly applicable in a number of areas of medicine in the coming years. So as all of you know, hemorrhage triggers a complex cascade of physiological responses, leading to a wider range of cardiopulmonary changes throughout the body. These compensatory mechanisms allow one to maintain their blood pressure and heart rate and other standard vital signs until loss of up to about 30% of one's total blood volume. With greater levels of blood loss, one's compensatory mechanisms begin to break down and one enters a stage of what we call decompensation or cardiovascular collapse. It's at that point in time when these compensatory mechanisms are really fading out, dropping out, and going away altogether. Until recently, these innate mechanisms that maintain cardiovascular stability were not really available to us. We didn't know about them. They've been hidden, and uh, only recently, through the technology that I'll describe today, have we been able to uncover many of the features in the waveforms that will allow us to, in the future, detect blood loss early, predict cardiovascular collapse, and monitor fluid resuscitation effectiveness. Graphically, the compensatory phase of central volume loss extends from normal volemia to decompensation or class three shock. The algorithm that I'm gonna describe for you today is, um, uh, calculates an individual specific beat to beat composite measure of compensation. What the algorithm does is it monitors a select group of waveform features that have been identified that trend the compensatory phase of central volume loss. We call this algorithm the compensatory reserve index or CRI. We like to think of CRI as a fuel gauge, where a CRI of one indicates a replete central volume or a full tank of gas, and a CRI of zero would indicate that the tank is empty, one has run out of gas, and it reached the point of decompensation. Values between one and zero indicate the compensatory reserve of the individual, or how much fuel is left in the tank. The underlying algorithms that allowed the development of this technology were originally developed by Greg Grudick and Jane Mulligan at the University of Colorado under a DARPA-sponsored program called Learning Applied to Ground Rock Robots. The purpose of the logger program was to develop new technology that would allow robots to autonomously navigate in outdoor unstructured environments, that is, battlefields. <clears throat> a key Issue in the field of autonomous robot, robot navigation is, is the need to identify safe, navigable terrain well ahead of the robot to allow smooth trajectories at acceptable speeds. Early investigators in this, in this area model specific features in a robot's environment like trees and paths and stop signs and people so that the robot could learn to 
navigate around these obstacles. These in early investigators soon learned, however, that there are an infinite number of objects in the environment and that this strategy was really not effective. What Grudek and Mulligan did was they used an entirely different approach. They used linear regression models and they used high dimension um, density models to identify features in the robot's environment that would predict path navigability. They linked these feature identification algorithms with this learning platform that would allow the features that it learned to reside in memory, allowing the robot then to refer back to memory when faced with, a, with an unstructured environment so it could predict which paths were navigable and which were not. Interestingly, the system grew increasingly more knowledgeable with greater numbers of training examples. If you think about it, medicine is a lot like that, especially the monitoring of blood loss. We learn to recognize the features of our bleeding patients, the signs and symptoms of blood loss. And we rely on experience in our memory to predict the clinical tra trajectory of our patients. This way we can anticipate their needs and intervene early when the physiology is less complex and more likely to respond to therapy. So we hypothesize that the feature extraction algorithms that Grudek and Mulligan had developed for their robot could be applied to the vital sign waveform data of a model of human blood loss. We thought that perhaps the feature extraction algorithms could deconstruct the vital sign waveforms to reveal vital sign waveform features that are associated with compensation. We also hypothesized that the machine learning algorithms could learn the compensatory feature sets to better identify patients who are bleeding and not bleeding. So we had a set of algorithms, but we didn't have any waveform data from bleeding patients. And ethically, you can't bleed patients from normal volemia to collapse. So we did the next best thing, and that is we found the best model of hemodynamic decompensation, or compensation and decompensation. And that model is located at the US Army Institute of Surgical Research in San Antonio, Texas. Dr. Vic Victor Convertino is the PI of that lab. And he's been collecting waveform data for a number of years. And back in 2008, um, we signed a, what's called a CRADA Cooperative Research and Development Agreement between the US Army and the University of Colorado. And Dr. Conovertino shared 28 subjects worth of data. The LBMP model is, is composed of males and females ages 18 to 55 years old who are healthy, non-smoking, and take no medications. These subjects put their lower body in this large steel chamber with a neoprene skirt around their waist, and a vacuum was applied to their lower body which pulls blood from the central volume, that is the upper torso, down into the pelvis and lower extremities in a stepwise fashion until they reach the point of decompensation, or class three shock. At that point, they release the lower body negative pressure, the blood flows back up into the upper body, and the subject recovers. Uh, they collect waveform data at about 500 hertz, and to date, they perform more than 250 LBNP experiments. This is a picture of actually one of Greg's graduate students who volunteered to undergo this. Um, Greg has actually also done it. I'm too old. I can't do it, fortunately. But the experimental protocol is shown in the upper corner here. This is the stepwise protocol. And then down in the, the lower hand corner there, you can see actually the non-invasive blood pressure waveform of a subject who's reached the point of decompensation you can see that the person's become bradycardic and hypotensive. Um, the experiment is stopped if the patient grays out, if they develop hypotension, if they complete the minus 100 millimeter level, or if they request early termination, such as for, for um, becoming dizzy or, or nauseous. So we wanted to know if the vital sign waveforms from the lower body negative pressure subject contain information on the physiology of compensation. But we didn't know which features of the waveforms were important or whether some features might be more important or, than others or perhaps more important at di different levels of compensation. To, this, to answer these questions, we turned our attention to the feature, feature extraction machine learning algorithms that Dr. Skrudek and Mulligan had developed for their robot. These unbiased analytical tools analyzed more than two million training examples, that is the waveforms, yielding more than 50,000 features within each waveform. They then selected more than 200 features 
trended this compensatory phase of volume loss. This is a schematic of the model building process that Drs. Grudek and Mulligan used to and continue to use to refine and develop the CRI algorithm. Uh, basically, they, they take waveform data, in this case generated in a model of human blood loss, and that data is analyzed by a set of autonomous feature extraction algorithms. These algorithms analyze the waveform data in high dimensional space to define what is known. The known data is then analyzed by a different set of algorithms, these mathematical modeling algorithms, which uh, define relevance. Uh, basically, these algorithms stratify the data into what is truly known, what is new, and what is not known. Interestingly, that only new knowledge is added to the models, and only the relevant parts of the models are, are modified. This means that new data doesn't require rebuilding the entire model, rather the model is simply updated. This paradigm means that over time, with limitless amounts of modeling data, the algorithm can become increasingly more accurate. So the CRADA was signed in 2008. We got 28 subjects worth of data, and um, Greg and his wife Jane began to look at the data using their existing algorithms. They looked at the EKG, they looked at the non-invasive blood pressure waveform, they looked at uh, the transthoracic impedance waveforms, and they found that the non-invasive blood pressure waveform was a feature-rich waveform from which to extract the features. Um, this actually was, is the picture of the first naive subject uh, that the algorithm analyzed. This is a subject that, that the algorithms had never seen before. And what you can see on the laptop, which is running the algorithms, is an upper red tracing, which is an algorithm that's estimating the level of lower body negative pressure that the subject is exposed to during the experiment. And the lower blue tracing is a prediction algorithm. This algorithm is predicting at what level the patient is going to collapse, or the subject's going to collapse during the experiment. And to our amazement, the subject collapsed when the two, when the two tracings converged upon the other. At that point in time, the lower body negative pressure was released, and you can see that the red tracing goes upward. Well, not so fast. So the first three subjects, everything went great. And then the fourth subject, this fourth naive subject, turned out to be a low tolerant subject. This patient collapsed very early at minus 45 millimeters of mercury. And you can see that the blue tracing, which was the prediction algorithm, failed. What this meant that was that the algorithm had not been trained with enough examples, particularly low tolerant subjects. So we needed to get more training data, and we needed to model the entire shape of the waveform to, model, to maximize the computational model accuracy. Over the next couple of years, we made some additional progress. Um, they actually combine both the estimation and the prediction algorithms into a single model to keep the baseline stable. This meant that CRI could now be an index where one is normal volemia and zero is collapse. And, and the, uh, the uh, results between one and zero would indicate the compensatory reserve of the subject. By 2011, the algorithm had been trained with more than 180 LVNP experiments of data, and we had narrowed the um, the window or the time frame that the model was looking at down to a 30B window. At this point, the, the model was now 95% accurate at estimating at what, where the subject was on that slope from normal volemia to collapse, regardless of when you actually ap applied the, the device to the individual. This is actually a, uh, yeah, it worked before. I don't know if you guys can click on that. Nope. I don't know if you guys can click on the video on the screen. It worked when I set it up. Just click on the, there you go. There you go. So this is actually a speeded up lower body negative pressure experiment. And you can see that all the standard vital sign data 
At the start of the experiment, the heart rate of the subjects in the 60s, the blood pressure is around 140 over high, you know, 87, 88. Uh, good mean arterial pressure, normal end tidal CO2 and pulse oximetry. Meanwhile, progressive amounts of lower body negative pressure are being applied to the subject's lower body, and you can see that CRI begins to fall. We're now at about 20 minutes of the experiment. Subject took some big breaths there. You can see that the vital signs are still pretty much in the normal range. The heart rate's in the upper 70s now. Still a great blood pressure, 130s over 86. And yet the CRI algorithm's telling us that you're down to about 0.2. The patient's really using a lot of compensatory mechanisms. Now you can see that the heart rate's climbing up into the 90s. Blood pressure is beginning to sag a little bit. The systolic's down in the 120s instead of the 130s. Mean pressure is actually still about the same. Now the mean pressure is starting to drop. Systolic starting to drop. And then boom, the subject collapses. So this data was actually presented at the Western Trauma Association meeting in 2013 in Snowmass and uh, led to this publication in the journal Trauma about uh, well, December of last year. And basically we showed that the algorithm could identify individual uh, uh, compensatory uh, changes uh, regardless of whether the subject was low tolerant or high tolerant. Of course, ethical constraints, there are some limitations. Ethical constraints limit the types and amounts of data available for modeling severe human blood loss. And for the same reason, direct comparisons between lower body native pressure and human hemorrhage are not possible. We also modeled only healthy subjects. We've never put a child into the LVMP chamber for fear they'd be sucked in. And we've also never, never placed older adults in there who might be at risk for a low flow state if they had some underlying coronary artery disease. One could also argue that perhaps injury and, ch and pain could, could change the features of the waveforms that we're, that we're abstracting and, and analyzing, and that's true. There's always that possibility. However, we, we believe that LBMP and actual hemorrhage are strikingly similar, and therefore that the LBMP model is a good one. To counter some of the concerns that LBMP is not a good model for human hemorrhage, Dr. Convertino and his group work with a group of researchers at the Southwest Research Center in San Antonio, Texas, where the largest um, primate colony in the U.S. Uh, is housed. And they studied 13 male baboons, and they had a hemorrhage protocol and an LBMP protocol. These baboons weighed around 30 kilograms, and they performed a stepwise hemorrhage procedure where they removed about 25% of each baboon's total blood volume in a four-step process, and then at the uh, end of the procedure, they re-infused the blood. Uh, during the experiment, they monitored the arterial blood pressure. Uh, they looked at the, they monitored pulse pressure and also central venous pressure. And then after the animal recovered and all the lines were taken out, they went back to the, to the lab four weeks later and they put the animal's lower body into this negative pressure chamber you see here. And they tried to mimic the same physiology that they observed in the animal during the hemorrhage study and, did, and took them down in a four-step process to a, what was equivalent to about 25% total blood volume loss. And then they released the lower body negative pressure and allowed the animals to recover. What you see here are a variety of vital signs on the y-axis and then across the bottom is the hemorrhage data and the lower body negative pressure data. And you can see that over time the pulse pressure the systolic arterial blood pressure, the heart rate, and the stroke volume were essentially equivalent during both the hemorrhage and LBMP experiments. What this graph here shows is the stroke volume change from baseline um, during the various experiments that were performed. So in the red, you have the baboon hemorrhage experiments, and you can see that with increasing amounts of blood loss, you have uh, decreasing uh, amounts of stroke volume in the black is the LBMP data from the baboons, and you can see that things overlap pretty nicely. And then in the green, you actually have the LBMP data from 170 humans who underwent lower body native pressure testing. And what this shows is that we're actually very similar to our primate friends in our response to lower body native pressure, and thus 
our, probably our response to actual hemorrhage. If you graph the CRI relative to the hemorrhage and the LBMP data, you see that they overlap pretty closely. And then if you do a linear regression model comparing CRI during LBMP and CRI during hemorrhage, you see that the, um, the coefficient's 0.96, so almost linear. So what this information told us was that the results uh, and the, the results supported the validity of CRI being an index of central hypovolemia associated with hemorrhage. Now the U.S. Army wants a small device that can be applied to an injured soldier on the battlefield to provide the medic with information on how well that, that patient is doing. They want to know if the patient's bleeding, and if they are bleeding, how much blood they've lost. They want to know how much fluid they need to give to that subject to keep them in a safe situation. And they want this information forwarded to a central location so they can begin to understand where the injured casualties are, how sick they are, and what it's going to take to extend and expend um, a, um, a helicopter and and uh, other methods to retrieve that individual. And they want this in real time, and they want it beat to beat. So I told you that the initial algorithms were built using the non-invasive blood pressure waveform from the NextFin monitor. But that wouldn't work, because that monitor weighs about 20 pounds. So we decided we better start taking a look at the pulse ox waveform. And so we pulled data from 30 subjects who'd undergone the LBMP trial and we found that we could pull the same information from the pulse ox waveform as we could from the non-invasive blood pressure waveform. What this means is that it's actually the flow of blood through the vessel that allows us to extract the features from the waveforms to calculate the CRI. This is a schematic of how the, um, the device that I'm wearing works. Um, this device actually has a little non-OEM um, three uh, pulse ox sensor board matched with a small processor, a Bluetooth radio, some memory, and a battery. And it looks at a 30-beat window of um, PPG waveforms. And it holds within its memory or its library um, a set of waveforms that describe the features and how they change from that period of normal volemia down to collapse. And then it kind of averages all those features to decide where you are on that slope from normal volemia to collapse. And it does all this in about 28 milliseconds, so you get a beat-to-beat -beat calculation of your CRI. Now, people often ask, what are the features that you're actually looking at? Well, we actually don't know what a lot of these features are. They're described mathematically by the algorithms. But we don't, we don't actually, we, we as humans can't really see these features as they change in the waveforms. What I can tell you is that there are some features that we can see if we look more carefully at the waveforms. And one of these is this oscillatory pattern that the very high tolerant subjects uh, demonstrate um, at high levels of lower body negative pressure. So you can see at zero LBMP that the systolic uh, blood pressure is about 116 and the diastolic is about 78. And then at minus 100 millimeters of negative pressure, you can see that there is an oscillatory pattern so that, such that the individual is able to drive the systolic blood pressure up um, again to about 116, but then there's kind of a fading, and then the sympathetic nervous system takes over again and drives the systolic pressure up, and then it fades again. This is a, an example of some LBMP data where you see a low tolerant subject who collapsed very early at minus 30 millimeters of mercury. There's no oscillatory pattern in that individual's waveforms. Below is a high tolerance subject, and you can see this oscillatory pattern. So this is, this is probably one of the features that the algorithm looks at to determine whether this is a high or low tolerance subject. This is some very recent data. It was actually submitted to the FDA um, in September this year. Uh, this work was carried out by David McLeod at Duke University. They used a very um, similar patient or subject group as the LBMP trial. These were healthy adults, 18 to 55 years old. They were monitored with a variety of non-invasive and invasive monitors, the non-invasive ones being the CC Nexfin and the non-pulse uh, ox as well as EKG. They placed a large bore IV in an anticubital vein and they 
um, drew blood, um, 333 uh, mLs, uh, three stages for the females, four stages for the males. So the females donated about a liter of blood and the males donated about 1.3 liters of blood. There was about a 15 to 20 minute pause between the draws and then at the conclusion the blood was reinfused uh, back into the individual. Um, these results are going to be published uh, in shock uh, probably early next year. Um, there were 20 patients recruited, five were excluded and 15 completed the study. The five that were excluded, two of them actually collapsed early. Um, there was one where there were no blood weights and so we couldn't get an accurate um, account of that and then there were two that the device didn't work properly. You can see that looking at these standard uh, vital sign waveforms, so there's baseline and then there's the blood loss data, so the females represent, the females and males are the first, um, well I should say the, the second, third and fourth data points and then the males alone are the, the fifth data points there. And you can see that the standard vital signs don't really change much over the course of the experiment. The systolic blood pressure stays within the normal range as does the, the oxygen saturation and the mean arterial pressure. The heart rate actually begins to increase uh, near the end of the experiment and CRI actually goes down um, with each stage of blood loss. Um, if you look at the linear coefficients, you see that stroke volume is really uh, quite similar to CRI. However, CRI is more specific and more sensitive than the stroke volume. Um, a couple weeks ago, we got data from Dr. McLeod on 20 additional human subjects. Um, two of those subjects collapsed early, and this is the waveform data from those who collapsed early. Um, the the, the uh, results are a little bit noisy because we used the fingertip pulse ox from Nonin, which is not the waveform that the algorithm was trained on. Um, but nevertheless, I, see, I think you can see, especially in the bottom tracing, that the red, which is the stolic blood pressure for the subject, is really quite stable during the blood loss uh, experiment while the CRI begins to decrease from the, from the beginning. And then you can see the patient collapses early um, and the CRI at that point's down to about 0.1. So let me show you a couple of clinical examples. We completed a, a 50 um, patient study at Denver Health uh, earlier this year and that data is being submitted to a scientific meeting so I can't present that data but I can show you a, a uh, one of the patients who was included in that data. Um, this is a 35-year-old male who was involved in a motor vehicle crash. He came in with bilateral femur fractures, pelvic fractures, an acetabular fracture, um, a splenic injury, multiple rib fractures, a pneumothorax. And you can see right from the get-go when the patient arrived in the ED that the CRI was about 0.1. Uh, the patient went to the scanner. Um, had a Foley placed, and you can see that uh, painful procedures tend to drive up the CRI a little bit, so th with Foley placement, the CRI bumped up to 0.4. Um, the patient also um, had a chest tube placed and some splints placed. Um, along the bottom is the time course. You can see that the patient went to the operating room, and interoperatively, when the patient was intubated, he became acutely um, hypotensive and desaturated, got a chest tube on the other side, during the course of the experiment, received, uh, not the experiment, but the course of the OR received four units of PAC cells, four liters of plasma light, and by the end of the case, the anesthesiologists were able to get the subject's CRI back into uh, the yellow and, and periods of the green range. Um, going back, you can see uh, the, the rest of the patient's clinical course for about, the, a course, for about um, uh, 20 hours. So there's a lot of information there and we're still trying to tease out how the algorithm responds to a variety of uh, clinical interventions. A couple years ago, the CEO of, the, of Children's Hospital asked how he could help support the work that we were doing and I recommended that we purchase the Bedmaster system, which is a, um, a system that allows us to pull all the waveform data from the monitors in the, in the first five trauma bays in the, IC, in the uh, e PZD as well as all the um, bedside monitors in the pediatric ICU. And I've got two quick clinical examples to show you how, despite our best, best efforts, we don't always recognize how sick our patients are. The, um, 
This first example was a 14-year-old male who was struck by a truck. He came in with a femur fracture, humerus fracture, fracture, brachial plexus injury, and lots of road rash all over. Um, he was initially seen at an outside hospital where he received four liters of IV fluid. Um, he was transferred to us. I should say at the outside hospital, he, had a, you know, he got pan scanned. He was transferred to us, got some additional IV fluid in the ED, and then went to the operating room uh, to wash out all of his road rash. Um, prior to going to the OR, we looked at all of his scans. The head was normal, the neck was normal, chest um, showed some um, minor rib fractures, and he had a little bit of fluid in his pelvis. He got all cleaned up. Uh, Post-op in the ICU, his base deficit was minus 10, crit was 23. Over the next several hours, he got some pack cells for a crit that had drifted down to 21. His base deficit was minus 4.5, so better than the minus 10.2s, so we thought we were making some progress. He remained quite tachycardic with his heart rate in the 150s. Over the course of the next day, his base deficit began to drop. He got some additional IV fluid. And then later on that evening, he coded. We got a chest x-ray and he had free air under the diaphragm. He had a delayed perforation. And so over the last several hours, um, he, had dis he had obviously um, third spaced a bunch of fluid in his abdomen. And if you look back, and this was retrospectively, we looked back, we pulled the waveform data from the bedside monitor, we ran it through the CRI algorithm. And you can see that the CRI was actually quite low, less than 0.2 for the majority of his ICU course until he collapsed. And this is one more um, study. This is a, uh, another example of an interesting case where we pulled the waveform data, ran it through the algorithm, um, and it revealed these findings. This was a 12-year-old female who was admitted with a massive upper GI bleed. She was on the medicine service. And a couple days after her admission, um, her hematocrit that morning was 30. Uh, she received a unit of platelets and some albumin for a high heart rate in the 140s. That led to a bump in her urine output, you can see in the purple down below. Unbeknownst to us, her CRI started to drop. She was getting physical therapy that afternoon when she had a large uh, emesis. She coded. Um, at that point, her hematocrit had drifted down to 16. Her base deficit was minus 8. She was resuscitated, rushed to the operating room, and she actually died in the operating room. So we pulled this data. We looked back, and we saw that the CRI actually started to fall about 16 hours before we detected the fact that she was bleeding. So these are some of the clinical studies that we're looking at currently. Um, the last patient in the 50 multi-trauma study that we completed at Denver Health earlier this year came in with multiple gunshot wounds and CPR in progress. When we looked at the CRI data, it was interesting that we could actually see that the CRI was about 0.6 as they were providing CPR for this individual. So we're beginning to look and see if the CRI might be a non-invasive means of monitoring CPR effectiveness. We have a number of different studies ongoing at Children's, Denver Health, and uh, University Hospital, which are listed here. I'm going to just touch on, uh, on two studies that I think are particularly interesting. Uh, one is dengue sh uh, shock syndrome. Uh, we have collaborations with two groups in Asia, one at the Hospital for Tropical Medicine in Ho Chi Minh City, including researchers from Oxford University and some engineers from Sierra Nevada Corporation. We have another uh, collaboration with the uh, Kham Phang Phet Pro Provincial Hospital in Thailand. Um, this is some data that I presented about a year ago in Bangkok where we took the non-invasive waveform, non-invasive blood pressure waveform from children presenting with dengue shock syndrome and we found that if we ran it through this algorithm that they were presenting with very low CRIs in the 0.2 to 0.3 range and then with fluid resuscitation over a several day period their CRIs were driven up into the normal range. You have to understand that, that um, you have to slowly resuscitate these patients in order to prevent third space losses, uh, ascites, pulmonary effusion, or pleural effusions, and, and, and things like that in order to prevent um, overhydration and the need to place these, pa these patients on the ventilator as they start to uh, remobilize their fluids. So these um, these two 
uh, groups are um, collecting waveform data. Uh, we hope to determine whether we can determine the compensatory stage at, with these, at which these um, patients are presenting with dengue. We hope to be able to stratify them into those and that are going to get over this with sort of, sort of self-limited disease uh, and also determine which are going to progress into full dengue shock syndrome. And hopefully we, begin, we can begin to track and uh, fluid resuscitation effectiveness in these patients. The point is, if we could deploy these, something small like this, a pulse oximeter, especially in um, very urban areas of these countries, um, perhaps they could more accurately uh, fluid resuscitate these patients. Um, lastly, I want to tell you about some work that we're uh, doing now to see if we can use this uh, feature extraction machine learning technology to provide additional information on our trauma patients. This is some porcine data, some pig data, in which a, an intracranial pressure monitoring device was placed on one side of the cranium and a balloon-tipped catheter on the other side. A, an, an invasive arterial catheter was placed in the aorta, and the balloon-tipped catheter was blown up slowly over time uh, to mimic an expanding epidural hematoma. What you see here in the green are the actual systolic